New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I'm with Leanne Whitney, and together we're going to introduce the video that Leanne recorded with my old friend Gary Zukoff back in 2005 on the topic of authentic power. Welcome, Leanne. Thank you, Jeff. Wonderful to be back with you again. It's wonderful that You've done this series of interviews from 18 years ago with me, with Peter Russell, uh, who I've known for many, many years and interviewed several times, with Russell Targ, one of my best friends, and with Gary Zukoff, a, a good friend who I've known for decades and with whom I had the great pleasure of traveling to Machu Picchu uh, many years ago. So, uh, you certainly picked the right people to interview. And uh, this one with Gary is a, a great conclusion to the four interview series. Beautiful. I, yeah. I, I mean, again, I was making a film at the time that I recorded all these interviews. So there was sort of an arc to um, <laughs> how I was sort of driving the knowledge base of the film and what I felt that each of you could bring forward. And of course, cutting a, a, a movie, you all would have only been in there for like two, three minutes, five minutes, maybe 10. Um, but here we have these extensive interviews and, and definitely there is an arc to the work and it, it's beautiful. And what I will do for viewers who want to see the others in this series and haven't had a chance, I'll link to them in the upper right-hand corner of, of your screen. Uh, I know some viewers can't activate the links. Uh, I think if you're using a cell phone, it may not work. If you have a laptop or a tablet, it probably will for people. So, Gary, of course, is uh, the author of uh, a wonderful book of physics, The Dancing Wooly Masters, but he's also written four or five or six best-selling books uh, on the series that began with The Seed of the Soul. That's right. And that was a very um, sort of revolutionary book for myself. Um, again, many of your viewers who have seen uh, your interviews with me uh, know that back in 2000, I had what is known as a pure consciousness event. And Gary's book, The Seed of the Soul, was one of the first books I turned to. At that time in my life, I couldn't read enough. I think I was reading a book a week. And his book, Seed of the Soul, was it just was so expansive for me. And I know it has been for many, many people. It's, like you said, New York Times bestseller. Gary's certainly an Oprah favorite. So he's been on Oprah's uh, Soulful Sundays and many times on her original uh, programming when she had her TV show, weekly TV show. So um, he has definitely inspired many people on the path for sure. I think Oprah invited him as a guest some 30 times. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. It's, yes, such a beautiful message. it's extraordinary. Well, and there you are in his living room in Oregon. Uh, we'll turn to that scene now. I love what you were saying earlier about the exploration. So. The exploration of the soul. Yeah. The exploration of non-physical reality. The exploration of the larger world in which we are awakening. Yeah. And so, you know, again, science is with the five senses, and you talk about the multi-senses. So, so somebody who is more familiar with five sense reality, you know, hard science empirically, um, maybe proving their reality or seeing their reality, how do you make the switch or is there a switch to make you know how how does is it just a natural evolution 
The physical world doesn't stop when you become multisensory. It continues. However, as you become multisensory, you begin to see meaning in it that you didn't see before. And you naturally begin to become more interested in the meaning, in what feeds you in a deeper way than on the surface appearance. For millennia, we've lived with the surface appearance, five sensory perception. And so we have become fascinated with the surface appearance. And we have developed a way of exploring those appearances and the relationships of those appearances. In fact, especially the consistent relationships between those appearances, and it's that on which empirical science is based. All of that remains. However, you are not limited to that. You begin to see that underneath all of that, underneath all that your five senses can provide you, is a living, wise, compassionate universe. How do you see it? You see it with your eyes. You look around with your eyes. You just see what your eyes saw before. But even as you're looking at what your eyes saw before, you can see a reason for it. You can see meaning in it. You can see purpose in it. And that means in your own life as well. That's multisensory perception. And intuition is a part of multisensory perception. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, let's mm-hmm. define multisensory perception. Is- multisensory perception is expansion of your perception beyond the five senses, beyond what you can taste and touch and hear and smell and see. You begin to see meaning in all that is around you. There's a Navajo saying, beauty above me, beauty below me, beauty in front of me, beauty behind me, beauty beside me, everywhere, beauty. That's a multi-sensory perception. It can also be a five-sensory perception because you can see beauty wherever you look. But when you can feel that beauty wherever you are, that's a multi-sensory perception. And that doesn't depend on your ears or your eyes or your touch or your smell. So multi-sensory perception is beginning to become aware of the fact that you are more than a body, that you are more than a soul, that you're... Your life is more than a random occurrence, that you are not an accident, that you are a powerful creator, that you have a role to play in the universe, and that role is your life, and you get to determine how you play it as a victim or as a creator, as one who is lost in despair or as one who creates in joy, as one who pushes people away, or one who opens herself to people. Now, in order to gain that freedom, you have to know yourself. You have to know your fears. That means you have to experience your fears. What do I mean by your fears? Your anger, your jealousy, your rage, your despair, your feeling of superiority, your feeling of inferiority, your feeling that you're entitled, your need to eat when you don't need to eat, your need to shop when you don't need to shop, your need to watch pornography on the internet or to have sex or to drink or to gamble. All of these are expressions of your fears. And as you begin to know your life, to illuminate all of the rooms in your mansion, to find out what's in them, to redecorate them if you choose, then your fears lose their power over you and you gain a freedom of expression, a freedom of creativity, a freedom of the heart, a freedom to recognize and utilize your wisdom that you couldn't have when you were caught or imprisoned in your fears, when you couldn't stop eating, you couldn't stop the critical thoughts in your mind about yourself or about other people. You couldn't stop needing sex. You couldn't stop wanting people to appreciate you. Or you couldn't stop wanting to push them away. All of that is the pursuit of external power. Right, right. Trying to rearrange 
what you can see with your five senses, what you can detect with your five senses so that you will feel better about yourself. As you become multi-sensory, you begin to see that the meaning in your life is deeper than the meaning you can find in your bank account. That the purpose you have in life is not just to get a partner in life that you can be proud of, but to love, to love all of life, to appreciate all of life. And you can't do that while you're frightened, which means angry, jealous, resentful, and so on. And so the spiritual path becomes finding your fears, learning how to experience what you are feeling emotionally every moment. Because when you're feeling anything that originates in fear, it hurts. You hurt. And then while you hurt, you can make a decision about what you're going to do next. So many people on this earth have hurt so much at one time or another that they've wanted to stop living. There's so many people who do not know how they can go on. They can go on. The pain that you feel is the pain that you were born to experience, to find the roots of, to pull the roots, to heal yourself. Now, where does intuition come into all of this? Well, yeah, I know. There's like so many avenues. Um, But this is a good one because um, for me in general, there's a lot of... Are we desensitized? Are we kind of numb? I mean, even walking into an airport today, I mean, the state of humanity, you just see it before you with all the metal detectors and everything that you have to go through just to fly with your fellow human beings on an airplane. And to me, every time I walk into an airport, that's just such an emotional experience. And I look around me and I think, are we desensitized? Are we numb? from really the state of where we're at in that sense, are we not feeling? Is that why potentially the healing hasn't reached a critical mass? Because there's a level of of numbness or desensitization to that. Yes, of course. (laughs) What you see as you become multisensory is the symbolic meaning of what is around you. You have brought up the subject of an airport. As you walk through an airport, of course, You see metal detectors. You see security people inspecting your suitcase. You also see your fellow human being shut down. They they are as armored as are the concourses. They are as protected as are the gates because they don't allow others at the airport into them. It's like being in an elevator together. Mm. They are all encapsulated in their own experience, and they are not feeling their own experiences. If they were, they would see that it is painful to be in an airport. It is painful to shut people out. It is painful to be frightened of the person next to you. Once you begin to experience your life, once you begin to become aware of in your life, a lot of things happen. And one of the things is that you become aware of the pain that is already in you. That's part of awareness. You can't just become, you can't become aware and just become joyful. Right. Because as you become aware, you become aware of everything in your life, including your pain. Now, as you become aware of your pain, you don't have to live in it. And you don't have to be controlled by it. You can't stop a painful emotion in the moment that it happens but you can experience it. And while you are experiencing it, you can decide what you're going to do next. Uh, But I think you say in the heart of the soul, the courage that it takes to face those emotions. I mean, that's where the real warrior comes in. For me, it's like, um, you know, a burn or a broken leg or something isn't nearly as painful as sitting and really dealing with the unconscious aspects of myself that I'm bringing forth in order to heal them. I mean, there's so much pain in that. It really takes strength, like strength beyond beyond is what I've found in my own process anyway. I don't know if you can shed some light on that, but I mean, it's courage and willingness are are two big ingredients, I think, that... That's right. Let's call it intention. Intention to heal. Intention to become aware. It takes a lot of courage to feel truly how much pain you feel when the person you want to live with doesn't want to live with you. It takes courage 
to feel the pain that you feel when your child is ill and you find out that she's not going to get better. Each time you feel as though you want to withdraw into a fetal position, as though you can't speak with people, as though you can't give yourself, and you feel that, you feel it in your body, and then you experiment. Then you decide to reach out and talk to someone anyway. You challenge that frightened part of you. And as you do that again and again and again, it loses its power over you and you gain power over it. And that's how you create authentic power. Now, there's a difference in covering up what you feel. I'm not talking about repressing or suppressing what you feel. Some people can't stop talking. That's how they cover up what they're feeling. I'm not describing that. I'm talking about feeling your life, feeling your emotions. And while you are feeling your emotions, then choosing what you're going to do about it. Most people, when they feel their emotions and those emotions are painful, the first thing that they want to do is blame somebody else. They say, you're the blame. You were going to marry me and you didn't. And I hurt, and you're the reason why. That's not really the case. The person who didn't marry you is the trigger of the pain, but not the cause of the pain. The cause of the pain is inside you. And until you find the cause of the pain, it will remain, and it can be and will be triggered again. Right, yeah. And again, Yeah. and again, and again. (laughs) Yeah, the way I... I, um, I've kind of tried to work with it in my process is anything that separates me from source. So if I'm not sitting in the dynamic of love with somebody mm-hmm. and I feel an element of tension or separation, I try to step back and burrow into my unconscious, I guess, is what you would call it. Like what is what is causing this tension to arise that I'm actually feeling separate from this person? And then I step back and try to work with it you know, from that point of view, watching them, you know, as they come up on my own, my own little yes. interaction, you know? Well, that's a beautiful and a powerful meditation. You can detach from what you are experiencing. Now, detaching from what you are experiencing doesn't mean you anesthetize yourself. It doesn't mean you don't feel it. It means you allow yourself to feel it fully, but you detach from it. That way you can really watch it. You can really feel it without it penetrating you as deeply as it used to in the past in terms of causing you to shout or withdraw or do the compulsive, obsessive or addictive things that you've done in the past. You can detach. You can look at your own life. You can look at your own feelings, your own pain, and then decide what you're going to do about it. That's what takes courage. But I'm not trying to make this something that's impossible to do because the alternative is that you don't do it. You habitually react as you have in the past and you create the consequences that you created in the past by reacting as you did. You push people away. You isolate yourself. You become lonely. You become insulated. You're not in touch with your own creativity. These are very painful consequences to create. Not feeling connected, not in touch with yourself, not in touch with those you love, not allowing yourself to feel how much you love, which means how vulnerable you can be. Because as you feel your love, you also begin to see how attached you are to what you love, and eventually begin to realize that's not really love. Right, right, yes. And so your life begins to become an experiment with you and you explore it. Become aware of your intentions and you will become aware of what you are creating and then you can start to create what you want. Yeah. Doesn't that sound inviting? It, it sounds very inviting. Um, the, the question, I think, becomes if it's a, an unconscious intention that is greater than the conscious mm-hmm. intention, the unconscious will win out. Yes, it will. So it becomes a case of really awareness. So you can be aware of when the motivation came from a place that wasn't from the consciousness, but from the unconsciousness, right? So the question becomes, how do you become aware of something you're not aware of? Exactly. How do you become conscious of your unconscious? There's lots of ways. 
I'm so glad you asked that question. Anytime somebody pushes a button and you have a reaction, you have just touched an unconscious part of your personality. Anybody says something, anytime anyone says something and you don't like it, and you become irritable or angry or defensive, ah, bingo, you've just experienced an unconscious part of your personality. So you become aware of the unconscious parts of your personality by becoming emotionally aware. Aware of what you are feeling. And whenever what you are feeling is painful, you are in touch with a part of your personality that is frightened. And those are often unconscious, but very strong. Now we are talking about the reason you were born. To find those unconscious parts. To experience them and to heal them by challenging them. That's the spiritual path. You challenge them by feeling them and then choosing differently. And as you become multisensory, you begin to see that every moment in your life offers you the opportunity to choose anew or to choose as you have in the past. There's wisdom in every choice. Why not experiment? Why not experiment with what I'm discussing? with what I'm suggesting. When you feel angry next time, when you detect that you're angry, stop what you're doing and feel it as fully as you can. And then in that moment, do something else. I know a lot about anger. Right, right. That's what I was going to ask you. a lot of my life (laughs) angry. You came about this maybe through, you you did your own experiments, and that's how you came to know that this stuff works, because it worked for you. It did. When I was in high school, when I was in college, when I was in the Army, I was very angry. I was bitter. I was resentful. I was a sex addict. I didn't like the world. I felt very much a victim. And I, that's not how I am now. So there's been a big change between who I was and who I am. And I know that if I can make that big change, anyone can make that big change because I'm not that special. But I've learned some things and I want to share those things. And that's what we're doing now. Yeah. Your intentions create your reality. And if you want to find what your unconscious intentions are, then you need to become aware of your emotions. Your emotions are the force field of your soul. They're not simply the random product of uh, neurotransmitters or the interaction of peptides or hormones. Those are physiological correlates of your emotions, but your emotions have a purpose. There's a reason for them. They are messages for you. And you don't have to read the message, but if you don't, the messages keep piling up. Ooh, yeah, I, I just—it's it, so huge for me because I really feel like you know, if we look at just the mother and her own emotions, you know, the, the rain or the thunderstorms or whatever, healing—it it, clearly the emotional body is such a part of healing. We were we were given emotions for a reason. You can't just spiritually bypass into some la la land, you know. And, and I, 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 from my own experience, I just. I find it so important that the emotional body must be exercised in this, you know, it's just such an important point of of spiritual growth, in other words. You can't just bypass it. You've really got to get into the whole emotional cleaning. Yes. That was a very painful moment in my life when I realized that the spiritual path was not going to be a detour around my agony. (laughs) It isn't. No, it's not. Isn't that a shame? (laughs) Why does it have to be that way? Why can't I become spiritual and enlightened and smile all the time? You can smile all the time, and a lot of people do, but it covers a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Pain that isn't recognized. And until that pain is felt, then that smiling person will be caught in the need for sex, the need to drink, the need to accomplish, the need to keep driving to new places in life. Always fleeing, always running, always running from the experience of his own or her own sense of powerlessness. Do you know what powerlessness is? Well, living in fear would be my gut 
answer. That's you know, right. Live, like being controlled by external circumstances <laughs> instead of being controlled by your internal sense of peace and um, at oneness with the world, really. That's exactly right. Powerlessness isn't a lack of external power. That's what most people mistake it to be. They say, I don't have enough money or charisma or... You know, I, I got a greeting card yesterday from a friend. It said, lack of charisma is lethal. Well, I laughed at that too. I thought it was funny. But there's a lot of people with charisma that aren't joyful. There's a lot of people with money that aren't joyful. There's a lot of people with everything they thought they wanted. And they don't have joy either. The lack of your ability to manipulate and to control others is not what I'm talking about when I say someone is powerless. When you feel the pain of powerlessness, it's the pain of wanting to belong. And you don't belong. It's the feeling of wanting to love and not feeling that you're capable of loving. It's wanting so much to be loved and feeling that you're unlovable, knowing that you're unlovable. That if somebody knew you for who you are, if they really knew you as you know you, they wouldn't want to know you, much less love you. That's the excruciating experience of powerlessness. It's wanting to be a part of life and not feeling a part of life. Ooh. Ooh. That's powerless. That's powerlessness, and it's very, very painful. Yes, and I was also going to add pervasive. <laughs> it is. Everyone experiences this. Yeah, uh -huh. This is the human condition. To say that the human species is insecure is to state the obvious. Now, the question is, what will you do about it? When you have these experiences, will you reach outward to try to change what's around you? Will you try to get a more attractive partner, a better house, a better job? Will you make yourself indispensable by becoming a professional? Or will you look... That's the pursuit of external power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we used to evolve through the pursuit of external power, but it doesn't work anymore. It only produces violence and it only produces destruction. It is evolutionarily obsolete. It's not negative. It just doesn't work. When electricity was invented, it didn't make candle power negative. Right. When you look in yourself to find the roots of this powerlessness and change them in yourself, that's the pursuit of authentic power. And that, by the way, is the evolutionary path that our species is now on. That is what the huge shift in human consciousness the shift from five sensory perception to multi sensory perception is bringing into our awareness a new understanding of power. No longer power as external, but power as authentic. No longer power as the ability to shape what is around you, to manipulate and to control circumstances and others, but the ability to create harmony and cooperation and sharing and reverence for life. The ability to find your own fears experience them, challenge them, and heal them so that you can be the person that you want to be, that you long to be, so that you can give the gifts that you were born to give. That's where your joy begins to ignite. Yeah, the, in the feeling of wholeness. And uh, my question is, like, is it because we're at a crisis point? You know, it, it, it is... <sighs> I don't want to say galactically because I just want to keep it to Mother Earth, really. But, you know, are we at a crisis point where, you know, we're at the pinnacle of external power? And, you know, if we look at all the wars that are being raged, you know, all around the world still today, um, or the destruction that we're doing just to our environment, um, you know. Or the destruction that we're doing to our families mm -hmm. as we get into power struggles and do not look at the source of the power struggle in ourselves as we criticize, as we blame. That is a type of violence and destruction just as much as warfare between nations is a type of violence and destruction. And the cause of both is the pursuit of external power. 
it is not that we are at a crisis point. We are in the midst of a birth, the birth of a new human species. And so everything is bewildering. Everything is confusing because nothing that worked previously works now. Nothing that we did habitually serves our health or serves the benefit of others. So we are finding what does, and that is the heart. We can't eliminate starvation on our planet by improving our capacity, our agricultural capacity to grow food, or our transportation capacity to move it around the earth, or our administrative capabilities to distribute it. We have all of that. And still people starve. And still they die. Horrifying, slow deaths that are unnecessary because we don't have the heart. We do have the heart. But we're not yet using it. The creation of authentic power will take you straight to your heart. But in that process, it will take you first to your fears because they keep you from exercising what your heart wants you to exercise. That is what you are calling the crisis point. It is a great transformation in the consciousness of humanity. The expansion beyond the five senses into multi-sensory perception, into the awareness of the universe is compassionate and wise. It's a beautiful vision. I mean, you know... It, it, it is a reality. Yeah, yeah. And if you even experiment with the reality, with the idea that this may be so, then the first question that springs to your mind with force is, if the universe is compassionate and wise, then why are there wars? Why is there starvation? Why is there brutality? Why is there such suffering on this earth? Why is the human experience one of misery for billions of people? Why do so many people wish they were never born? Why this suffering? Why this brutality? And the reason is we put it. We created it, and it will remain until we create differently. The human experience does not have to be one of brutality and exploitation. It was not meant to be one of brutality and exploitation. To change it, look at the brutality in yourself. Look at the need to exploit in yourself, not with judgment, but with courage and clarity and honesty. Become emotionally aware. Start to experience what you are feeling when someone disapproves of you. Start to experience what you are feeling in your body when you're frightened to pay the rent or that you can't or when someone that you want doesn't want you, start to step into your life with awareness, including emotional awareness, especially emotional awareness. And you will find that the ways that you avoid that awareness are often brutal. That is where the brutality is to be found in you. Right, right. And that is where it is to be healed in you. Then, a part of yourself will say, but what good will it do if I heal my brutality when everyone else remains brutal? That is how you disempower yourself. That is how you turn your back on your own creativity, on your own reason for living. That is how you attempt to make the magnificent creative being that you are into something that is invisible and small, but you cannot. Yeah. You are not invisible and you are not small. What happens is that you continue to create powerfully, but your creations are brutal. And so you continue to contribute to the brutality of the world. When you change yourself, you change far more than you know, far more than you can see. The more your fears control you, the less you are able to give your gifts, which means the less meaning there is in your life. And the less your fears control you, the more you are able to give your gifts. And there is the joy. And if you are a soul of greatness like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or the Christ, 
the gifts that you give touch all of life. You have that capability. Everyone has that capability. Mm -hmm. Use it now. Use it now. And if you feel that you are not able to answer that calling, then start the process of creating authentic power. That's how you use your life wisely. That's what your life was given to you for, to find what is constricting you, constraining you, imprisoning you, bringing brutality into the earth school and exploitation changing it in you, your anger, your righteousness, your judgment, your superiority, your inferiority, challenging, challenging them in yourself. Right. It, and again, can you say that up until now with the five sensory creation, it's been by and large unconsciously created? Yes. So now it's it's multisensory, which let, let's go into a, a bit more there with the multisensory and the intuition, Let but me, it's multisensory is the, is the conscious creation. Oh, no, no. Oh. Okay. Multisensory perception does not make you happy, does not make your life smooth. It simply makes you aware of more. Good point. We very, very, I'm so glad that you said that. It, it's so true. It's so, because I, I know, you know, a lot of people who are psychic, who are really, really can see inside the holograph. That doesn't mean that they're on a higher plane or more peaceful or anything like that. They just happen to, have developed their multi senses, but it, it 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 isn't necessarily meaning that they're um, in their authentic power. Indeed, it doesn't mean that at all. Your multi sensory perception is emerging. You don't have to make it emerge. It's emerging in millions of people in their own ways. They are becoming aware that they are more than they thought they were. That their life has meaning that they didn't see before. That there is a purpose in some way to their existence on this earth. That is the emergence of multisensory perception. It is replacing cognition. Intuition is replacing cognition as the primary human decision-making faculty. And there will be ways to develop and strengthen intuition as you honor your multisensory perception, just as there are ways to strengthen and develop Cognition. But becoming multisensory does not mean becoming fulfilled. Right. It doesn't mean becoming joyful. It simply means you're aware of more. And part of what you're aware of are the dynamics that you are using to create physical reality. You're becoming, you're beginning to be open at least to the suggestion that you create with your choices with your choices of intentions. And so you can experiment with that. You don't have to take it on faith or belief. I ask you not to. We are talking about authentic power, not the power of a follower. There is no power there. Not the power of a victim. There is no power there. Not the power of one who has successfully pursued and won a gold medal, there is no power even there because someone else will eventually win that medal. Right. And you will always be in fear of losing it. As we become authentically empowered, as that becomes consciously our evolutionary modality, we are becoming humans who are citizens of the universe first and of all else second. We are becoming partners with the universe first, and Americans second, French second, Japanese second, women black, white, brown, yellow second, rich second, wealthy second, male, female second. Everything is second to life with a capital L. Mm. We are becoming citizens of life, adversaries of life, proponents of life. And that means all forms of life. It means that your allegiance is to life first and to your nationality after that, to your religion after that, to your sex after that. That is the universal human. 
Mm, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And my question, I guess, too, is where does, does a belief in God play a part in this? Like, does one have to believe in God to really um, begin to strip off the layers and see this evolution or not? Divinity is everywhere. This is a divine universe. So whatever your understanding of divine intelligence is, use the name that you prefer, use the emotional experience that you prefer. Underneath all of that is a universe that is alive and wise and compassionate, a universe with which you co-create the experiences of your life in the realm of time and matter and duality that are always the most appropriate for your spiritual development. In other words, in whatever circumstance you find yourself, that circumstance is perfect for you to be in, given the wisdom of the choices that you've made. And no matter who is in that circumstance with you, the learning potential for each is enormous and equal. So you will never find yourself in the company of two other people who are stage props right. in support of your evolution. The interaction itself provides the perfect opportunity for each individual involved. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's beautiful. The harmony and the synchronicity and all of, the, of those aspects of it. Precisely. Yeah. That is divinity in action. And I think it's important, you know, <coughs> one of the biggest influences I see in my external world on the planet is, is Christianity. It has like, say, 2 billion followers out of the 6 billion of us. And... I grew up actually in a Catholic environment and there was so much of what I perceived as external power happening within that religious system that it actually alienated me. And I, I thought the teachings of Jesus were amazing, but I couldn't uh, reconcile the hypocrisy of what I saw in a fear-based way of like um, a great bearded man in the sky who's going to judge me at the end of my incarnation. That just, none of that makes sense to me. Um, or, you know, confessing my sins to somebody else, to some, some other human beings above me that I need to, you know, lay my sin, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I think the definition of God is almost, what word do I want to use? Um, it has so much baggage attached to it um, that it's almost like individually we need to experience it and redefine it on a soul-to-soul -soul or human-to-human -human basis so um, we can receive the vastness of what it is as opposed to what we've been told or uh, a lot of the, I guess, dogma or teachings that to me are so prevalent and heavy on the planet. There's a difference between religion and spirituality. Spirituality is a direct connection with the divine, is a reverence for all of life, is knowing that we are a part of a magnificent, unfathomable, ungraspable kindness, goodness, grace. Religion is an institutionalized structure designed in some way with some hope to express that. There are spiritual people within religions. Not all religious people are spiritual people. We say, I do something religiously. I follow this every day religiously. That's actually an accurate use of the term. It means we do it consistently. We really apply this practice. But when your heart comes alive, when you see that the universe is alive, when you see that there is a divinity, a divine intelligence, and you are in connection with it, it is in you. It is around you. It is everywhere. There is nowhere that it is not. And that becomes spirituality. I've met many people within religions who are spiritual. Religions are cultural expressions of universal truth. They are universal truths that come through the filters of a culture. Cultures are based in fear. Cultures separate an us from a them. There is a fear-based orientation to all cultures, and it persists strongly today. Otherwise, the reality that we are all brothers and all sisters would be a living experience in the heart of all. Right, right. Yeah, so let's take a moment and, and define intuition then. How, how, how do you define intuition exactly? 
Intuition is the voice of the non-physical world. And so you cannot come to terms with intuition without coming to terms with the existence of non-physical reality. Intuition is access to wisdom and compassion that is beyond what we can give to each other. Intuition is like a radio receiver that can receive more stations than one. For example, it's through your intuition that you are in touch with other souls that are in advance of your own. It's with intuition that you are in touch with your own soul, by the way. That's the higher self experience. It is through your intuition that you are in touch with your non-physical teachers. That's teacher with a capital T. Mm -hmm. Teachers are non-physical. Let me put it this way. Teachers are impersonal energy dynamics that we personalize, that we tend to look at as having personalities the way we do. They are not. They are impersonal energy dynamics that are always available to you, that are always with you. Intuition gives you access to all of that. Your intuition serves different purposes. Your intuition will help keep you safe and on the earth school. It's the hunch to check your brakes before you take a long trip. It's the hunch not to walk down a dark street by yourself at night. Your intuition will support your creativity. It's the hunch to go to a conference where you meet just the colleague that you've been looking for, or it's the thought that you should go to lunch with a friend who introduces you to just the cameraman that you need for the project that you are creating. It is the feeling that you should share a thought with a friend who says, I've been thinking just about the same thing, and then you get into a conversation that is very rich and fulfilling for you. Intuition serves your spiritual growth. It's the insight that you've been looking for. It's the understanding that makes clear your confusion. It is the realization that allows different pieces that couldn't fit together before, that were too painful to even try to put together before, to fit together into a picture of extraordinary beauty. Yes, in the, I mean, man searched for meaning since the dawn of time. You know, man has searched for meaning. What is this? What are we? And I think what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, but intuition really helps you get that meaning. It really helps you understand the grandeur and the magnificence and the awe of what's taking place. That's correct. And multisensory perception is a way of experiencing it, of actually participating in the experience. Intuition is a part of multisensory perception. Intuition is the voice of the non-physical world. It's what allows you to talk, to communicate with your higher self, with souls in advance of your own, with teachers with a capital T. Now, everyone experiences intuition differently. In other words, everyone has a different intuitional structure. Some people can hear words. That's not necessarily the most advanced way of experiencing intuition. We intellectuals sometimes think that it is, but it's not. Some people have a direct kind of uh, understanding. Some people have experiences in which they uh, take journeys. Other people feel sensations. Other people hear sounds. Some people see colors. Some people do have combinations of that. They can see sounds, or hear, right. hear colors. No matter what your intuitional structure, allow yourself to recognize its reality and to cultivate it. So there's no right way and wrong way of, use, of receiving intuition, of hearing intuition, of sensing intuition. And your non-physical guides and teachers will not tell you what to do. They will not direct your actions because they cannot take responsibility for how you choose to spend your energy, for what consequences you will create. They will not experience those consequences. You will. And so it's only you. It's up to you, yeah. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. You must make the choices. You cannot stop making choices. You are a creative being. 
The choice not to choose is a choice that creates consequences. You cannot stop choosing. You cannot stop creating. And whenever you create, you experience what you create. So the spiritual path is a path of becoming aware of what you are creating, what you have been creating unconsciously so that you can start to create with awareness, the ability to create consequences that are constructive, that are joyful, that give to life, that celebrate life, that support life, that nurture life, just as you want to be celebrated and appreciated and nurtured. Multisensory perception helps you to see that you are, by the earth, for example, by your non-physical teachers, by all that surrounds you. So you can see intuition and multisensory multi-sensory perception are intertwined, but intuition is a part of multisensory perception. Now we're speaking about intuition now for this moment. Mm-hmm. Your guides and teachers will never tell you, do this or do that. They will show you options that you may not have seen. They will help you to see the consequences that your different options will create. They will guide you to the breath and depth and scope of your own power and help you to use it wisely. So if you hear a voice in your head that says, the, that that person is evil, I must kill him, you are not in touch with a non-physical teacher. You are not in touch with your intuition. You are in touch with a frightened part of your personality. The inmate who killed Jeffrey Dahmer, who was himself a murderer, said, I, God told me to kill Jeffrey Dahmer. That was not a voice of the divine. It was a voice of a terrified part of this inmate's personality. I'm often asked to questions uh, about the difference between intuition and voices that are not healthy. Ask yourself these questions if you hear a voice. Is what I am hearing healthy? Will it create harmony? Will it create cooperation? Is it sharing? Does it revere life? Ask yourself these critical questions. Don't indulge in your need to be a victim by saying, the devil made me do it. Right. It is your own fear, your own unchallenged, unexamined fear that creates the painful consequences in your life. And you were born to find that fear, experience it, challenge it, and heal it. Right. And again, all that stuff being the unconscious elements that we're bringing, exactly. that we're bringing light into the darkness. In other words, it's, it's shedding light on those darker aspects yes. of the self and of humanity. And, and your intuition is a source of guidance and assistance that you can access in this process. For example, if you're about to say something or do something and you're not sure what your intention is, ask yourself, what is my motivation? And then listen. Listen for an answer. And your answer will come. Whenever you ask for help or ask for guidance, you always get an answer. It may come the next day. It, it may come in a dream. You may have to relax and drive into town. You may have to take a walk through nature, but the answer will come. Yes. Now, let me ask you about now the multisensory. Is that clear audience, clear sentience? Is that what we're talking about here? intuition helps us develop those clairvoyant abilities. Would you explain what you're What I mean by that? Like um, being able to, um, how I would define clairvoyance would be uh, being able to see beyond what I see with my eyes right here in hard matter. Yes, that's multisensory perception. Yeah. And it comes in all those formats. Like it's being able to see the non-physical, hear the non-physical, feel the non-physical. Yes, but don't uh, think that it needs to be mystical or something mysterious. Mm -hmm. You can walk down the aisle in a grocery store and someone walking towards you is known to you without your having met that person before. You can know, for example, something about other another person that you don't have a physical way of knowing. For example, you might meet someone and know that this person is divorced and shattered and is very uh, much in pain and struggling 
to uh, function in her life. You uh, can meet a person who's very uh, sophisticated and polished, and yet know that this person is not someone to be trusted. You can meet someone who's rough, who looks abrasive, and yet you can know that this person has a kind heart. These are all experiences of multisensory perception, accessing data that you cannot access through your five senses. When you look at life as meaningful, when you can begin to see the symbolism, the living symbolism in your life and in the experiences of others and your interactions with them, that is multisensory perception. Right. When you can begin to see the perfection in your life and in the lives of others, in the lives of all, that is multisensory perception. Yes. And, and is that the symbolism of the quantum then in science, um, getting into the heart of, of, of matter, just like we are all evolving, so we're all getting to the heart of ourselves individually? That's a lovely way of using your understanding of quantum physics. I hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, for me, um, quantum physics shows a certain kind of behavior that illuminates the nature of consciousness. For example, a physical system can be in one state and suddenly be in another state. First it's in state A, then it's in state B. This happens in the subatomic realm continually, and there's nothing in between state A and state B. First it's one thing, and then it's another thing. Your consciousness is like that. Your consciousness has the ability to expand enormously in a moment. You can become enlightened in a moment. You can see what you have never seen before in a moment. You have that capability. When you are depressed and you do not know if you can go on with your life, if you cannot see a beginning or an end to your pain, if you feel that you can never express it to anyone else because no one could ever feel this way, if you feel that you would only be a burden, if you tried to express what you're feeling to someone else and you would rather just be by yourself and you spiral downward and downward, this is depression. You don't have to stay there. Your consciousness can shift in a moment. Right. It doesn't require a pharmaceutical. It can shift. I'm not saying not to use any aids that you find on your path, including pharmaceuticals, but if you depend on them to give you the meaning and the fulfillment that you want, you'll find eventually that they won't be able to and that the pain will break through them, even there, even in that drugged, pharmaceutically manipulated state. Your pain will enter your consciousness, because your pain has a purpose. It's to bring your awareness to those parts of your personality that are frightened, those parts of your personality that you need to heal. And when you mask your emotions, you can't find them, you can't heal them, you continue to create destructively, impulsively, compuls compulsively, addictively, obsessively. Your intuition helps you to see all of this. You can ask questions. You can get answers, but you must make the decisions in your life. Only you can. So your non-physical teachers will never direct you. They will never instruct you in what you must do, but they will instruct you in what you can do. They will show you possibilities. They will literally enlighten you, but it's up to you to use what you hear. Many people have a very good intuitional structure and they hear what they don't want to hear. And so they <laughs> pretend that they have heard nothing at all. Right, because right, it's so hard to make the shift. I mean, it is challenging to make the shift, but the fact of the matter is it's a choice. You can stay in the pain <laughs> and you can stay in that, um, you know, cyclical pattern, or you can hear and know, okay, this is an addiction, I need to face this, or whatever it is that you're hearing, you know, and, and make the choice to say, okay, I can face it now. Or not. Or not. We have a friend who told us that he knew while he was walking down the aisle 
that he was making a mistake. He saw a painful life that was coming, and he didn't stop. Instead, he said to himself, but what will I tell all of the people? Where will we, what will we do with all of these gifts? He had an excellent intuitional understanding of what he was creating, but he chose not to listen to it. There are people who have invested a great deal of energy in a profession, for example, and yet they know somewhere within them that this is not the path that will lead them into their greatest fulfillment. Sometimes they make a leap into another life path, and other times they don't. Right. There is no superior or inferior way. There are choices, and there are consequences. There are causes, and there are effects. And this is at the heart of authentic power realizing that you will not be judged or rewarded by the universe. You will not be condemned or condoned. The universe will support you no matter what your choices are in moving into your fullest potential. You can choose a path of violence. You can choose a path that you know will not be to your best interest and will not benefit others, and still walk down that path. And the universe will still support you. It will always support you. Right. Once you understand that, you will see that you are free. You are free to create. You are free to create with fear or with love. You are free to create a world that nurtures life or a world that exploits life. And you begin with yourself. Yeah, because again, if you ask for help on the outside, it's still external. So if we're talking about authentic power and everything coming from within, it's literally all got to come from within. Yes, like, the intention <laughs> is yours. Yeah. The commitment is yours. The discipline or the skill of creating emotional awareness is yours. The support is the universe's. Right. When you start your journey toward wholeness, it may be that only a very small part of you wants to go there. Maybe only 5% of you is interested in health, and 95% is not. But it's that 5% that the universe backs. The universe is always supporting your spiritual growth in every way. Mm -hmm. In painful ways, that you have created, and in joyful ways that you have created. And when you begin to see that, your perception will shift from being that of a victim to being that of a creator. And then the question becomes, what will I create? Right. How can I create differently? If you encounter a painful experience, instead of saying, poor me, why me? Why did this happen to me? Instead say, why me? With a very different slant. Say, how did I create this? What did I do to bring this into being? What could I have done? And if the painful experience is one that cannot be explained in terms of the experiences of your lifetime, such as, for example, being sexually abused as a child or being uh, having a, a cancer very young, mm -hmm then you will not be able to answer that question from the perspective of this lifetime. That will require the perspective of your soul. And that is what you are beginning to be able to access with multisensory perception and with the assistance of your intuition. More specifically, with the assistance of your guides and teachers through the faculty of your intuition. As you begin to see that your life is not the complete book, it's a chapter in a book. What happens when two people meet? and decide to form a partnership? What's the potential? What happened before birth? And how does that affect what happens after birth? What happens after death? And how is that affected before death? What is death? And what is birth? These are exciting things. And they go far beyond DNA, RNA, and statistical populations to determine what the probabilities of your parents' meeting are. They're far more meaningful. They are the very 
essence of your life, of the universe, of meaning. This universe is a spiritual enterprise, not a material one. And that's what we're beginning to see. Including people who are professional scientists. And they are the ones who will begin to reorganize science. They are the ones who will begin to see the limitations of their methodologies and create new methodologies. And they are the ones who, above all, will begin to see that the validity of the science of the soul is not anchored in empirical reality. That is trying to prove the existence of the set with a subset. You cannot prove the existence of the greater with the lesser. There is no way that empirical science or any empirically based endeavor, intellectual or physical, can prove the existence of God. It cannot be done. But you can experience it yourself. Right, yes. You can begin to experiment with your own creative capability. You can begin to see the meaning in your life and see it in the lives of others. And from that will come a new science, the science of the soul, which in my opinion is a great deal more exciting than the science of quarks and neutrinos. <laughs> right, and the fact that you say it will come, but it really has come. You know, you're a Harvard educated, and you know, if we take these external things, Peter is from Cam Cambridge yes, educated, two very prestigious <laughs> universities. Here's two scientists that have come out of those systems talking about the science of the soul. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I mean, so really, it, it is here. It's just how fast is it going to catch on and how quickly, you know, does that curve happen? Very fast. Very fast. From an evolutionary point of view, it is less than an eye blink, less than an impulse of an eye blink to say that human consciousness will shift this dramatically, this thoroughly, within only a few human generations. But that is what is happening. We are on the threshold. We are actually past the threshold and standing in new territory now. That's why it's so exciting to be alive. All of what we see now that is based on external power, which is all of our social structures, by the way, almost all of our policies, environmental, economic, foreign, domestic, all that is based on external power is analogous to a railroad train that has run out of fuel, a steam engine that's out of coal. It's still moving by force of its own inertia, but it's going to come to a stop. You know, when I was living once uh, in a coastal community, there were cliffs that I love to walk along. They're high and crumbly. And the ocean was reclaiming them, and had been for decades. On one part of these old cliffs was an old Victorian house that was charming from the roadside. But as I walked around the side to try to see what the side yard and the backyard looked like, I discovered that only the front third of the house was still on the cliff. That two-thirds of it was cantilevered over space. It had been condemned a decade ago. The house was still standing, but it was only a matter of time before it fell. All of the structures that are built on the perception of power as external are like that house. They are still standing, but they have no future. And so people see the dysfunction that is becoming more and more apparent in all of the social structures that are based on the perception of power as external and think that that is a crisis, but it's not. It is a profoundly positive phenomena that we are witnessing. It is the end of one grand banquet. Mm. Evolution through five sensory perception, through the pursuit of external power, where the goal is survival, to a new banquet of multi-sensory humans in which evolution requires the creation of authentic power in which the goal is spiritual growth. And all that pertain to the old banquet 
is now being swept from the table in preparation for the new. So we are in this past the cusp into the new territory. We are all pioneers now. This doesn't make us better than anyone else because, as I mentioned before, by the time my granddaughters have granddaughters, this will all be the experiential baseline of the human experience. And I pray that it will be a wise and a kind experience because multi-sensory perception is coming to all. But authentic power is not. Authentic power must be created. It must be developed. It must be brought into being in your life, choice by choice. It can only be brought into the life of each individual, one by one, right. by his or her choices of commitment, of intention to become emotionally aware, to become a conscious creator, and to use that creative capacity in the most constructive, life-giving way. Yeah, and I have to tell you, as you were just saying about clearing the banquet and the new banquet, I can't begin to tell you how full emotionally I was and just feeling it right here. And again, it's just truth. I mean, that vision and the, the beauty of all of that, when you take that in, I mean, it's just... It's uh, yummy, isn't yeah, it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, awesome to say the least. It really is awesome. And that is the world in which we're living now. A world in transition. A world in which that which does not contribute to life is falling away. It's falling away as it becomes more and more and more dysfunctional, as it produces more and more of what we don't want, which is violence and destruction. And that's all the pursuit of external power can now produce. Right, right. And now, did you um, arrive, uh, let's say, to these teachings or to these beliefs or standing in these truths through your own personal experience of what I call transmutation almost, the alchemy of taking your own suffering, your own pain, and transmuting it into the grander, you know, universal view of love and unity instead of the separation. I didn't quite understand your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, what I'm saying is, you know, because earlier, obviously, you said you were an angry person. And, yes. you know, you've had, you know, these vast experiences. I know you come from Vietnam and that's your history. And um, taking that kind of, um, again, I, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to speak for you, but aggression, anger is aggression, and transmuting it into something different that becomes more love and, and universal and unity. And It wasn't a single step process for me. I uh, could hardly wait to go to Vietnam when I got out of Harvard because I had that much rage in me. I wanted to kill, and that was a legal way to do it in a way that I felt was manly and heroic. And so I enlisted in the infantry. I remember the non-commissioned officer at the recruiting station telling me that I would have three choices when I enlisted in the army, and the army would ensure me that I would get one of them. And I wrote on my three lines, infantry, infantry, infantry. And he got a big smile on his face, and he said, boy, you're going to get just what you want. <laughs> And so I enlisted in the infantry, and I went through all the infantry training that the Army can offer, including Infantry Officer Candidate School, which I was fortunate enough to get into. And when I got out of that, I went to jump school, parachute school. And when I got out of that, I went to Special Warfare School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And that's where I became a Green Beret officer. And from there, I was sent to Okinawa. And from there, I went on missions to various top secret activities in Southeast Asia. For me specifically, it was Vietnam and Laos. So, and I was a sex addict and I wasn't a nice person. So that's where I was and where I am now is very different. But the movement from there to where I am didn't descend upon me. Uh, no lightning came down that changed my world. It was a really um, challenging path. But the path that I was on was creating so much pain, 
that I'm grateful every moment that somehow the universe began to steer me in this direction. And I can see now that it's steering millions of people in this direction. The first big change came in my life when I got excited about quantum physics. I got invited to a meeting of physicists at the, at the, at the Berkeley Lawrence Laboratory in Berkeley, California. And I went out of curiosity. And I discovered that they were talking about consciousness and whether it creates reality or not. And I got so excited, I couldn't sleep that night. And I went back the next week and the next, and they allowed me to come back. And I decided that I wanted to learn how to articulate the things that were exciting me so much, but that I couldn't express. So I started to read. And at first, not much happened, but then I slowly began to be able to understand things like uh, the uncertainty principle and complementarity and a wave function and what it is and how it works. And then I got the idea to write a book about this so that people who would come after me and would want to know about quantum physics but not be interested in mathematics like me, I have no interest, and not have a scientific background like me, I had no scientific background, but had a liberal arts orientation, that people like me, like them, would be able to have a gift on a platter of what I was learning, of what was so exciting me. And so I decided to write a book. And that book was called The Dancing Wu Li Masters, an overview of the new physics. Wu Li is the Chinese word for physics, but it also means patterns of organic energy, which is how the Chinese refer to physics. And in addition to that, however, it means uh, my way, nonsense, I clutch my ideas, and enlightenment. Mm. So I use that beautiful metaphor, which was given to me by the Tai Chi master, Al Huang, to express the content of quantum physics, particle physics, relativity, and some uh, very exciting conceptual physics in a way that non-physicists would appreciate and in fact find fun, because I found it fun. Now, I'm telling you about this because it was in the writing of this book that I started to discover new things that I had never known before. First of all, this book was more intelligent than I was. <laughs> it had more of a grasp of the material than I did. And it was funnier than I was. I was a pretty heavy dude in those days. I can still be a pretty heavy dude. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed writing the book. It was exciting. And I forgot to be terrified that I couldn't pay the rent. I forgot to be angry that I wasn't appreciated. I forgot to be resentful. I forgot to think about sex. I forgot all of that when I was writing the book. Writing that book was my first experience of authentic power. I didn't know that there was a name for it, but it was a beautiful experience, and it was my first gift to life that created it. Because until that time, when I started writing The Dancing Wu Li Masters, everything I did in my life was for me. It was a scam for me. But writing The Dancing Wu Li Masters was a gift. It's ironic, I think, that I got so much out of it. <laughs> because, but the intention was to give a gift to other people and to make it the best gift that I could give. And I did make it the best gift. I oh, had the brilliant. most wonderful experience with that. There was... Um, Sterling Moss was one of the most well-known race drivers and racing car drivers, Formula A drivers in the world at the time. And someone once asked him why he loved racing, and he said, because when I come out of a, a four-wheel drift around a corner, lines perfectly up to straightaway with my foot flat to the floor on the accelerator. He said, I feel like thumbing my nose to the world. And I was saying, hmm, beat that if you can. You can. It's perfect. That's how I felt when I wrote The Dancing Wooly Masters. Not that I was thumbing my nose at anyone, but that I could say, beat that. You can't. It's perfect. Not that you can't write a better book, but I can't write a better book. Right. This is the best. This is it. And it was a wonderful feeling. It still is a wonderful feeling. 
I discovered in that process, too, that I wasn't alone in writing the book. I didn't channel the book. I don't channel books. But I discovered what the Greeks, what the ancient Greeks called the muses, the source of inspiration. We can put a more accurate label on it now. It's non-physical assistance, guides and teachers with a capital T, impersonal energy dynamics that are always with us. It's impossible to create alone because it's impossible to be alone. And I could feel something in my life happening that was unlike anything before. And I decided to commit myself to that. Whatever it was, I wanted more of it. I wanted to live my life the way this book was being written, uh, spontaneously, intelligently, joyfully. And I've come a long way toward doing that. So that was one of the experiences that I had that moved me along my path. The Dancing Wooly Masters um, got a rave review in the New York Times the night before it was released. I'd never written a book and I never liked physics. And this reviewer couldn't say enough about it. He happened to love it. Millions of people have felt the same way about it, but this one happened to work for the New York Times. And he wrote about it. And so that started a career, what could have been a career as a popularizer of science. And people expected me to write a sequel, like The Son of Bully Masters, about maybe biogenetics or another cutting-edge component of science. And I did start to write a book called Physics and Consciousness. And I still love the idea. And I love the book that I was writing. It was very conceptual and very good, I felt. It was about the relationship between depth psychology, the structure of depth psychology and the structure of quantum physics. They're the same. But somewhere in that process, something else happened to me. And I discovered in a more concrete way for me, non-physical reality. I discovered it exists. I discovered this world is more than I ever thought it was, more than they taught me about at Harvard. Right. More than I learned in Kansas. <laughs> more than I learned in Texas where I was born, more than I learned anywhere. And I'm not alone. Millions of people are beginning to sense this. There are angels on the cover of Time magazine now. This is the huge transformation in consciousness, and it touched me and it touched my life. And I found myself writing another book about evolution, about the soul, about emotional awareness and responsibility, about karma, about trust. And I called that the seat of the soul. And then came the time to publish it. And I realized that if I did, I was going to disappoint a lot of people who were expecting my next book to be another delightful expose or exploration of or adventure into cutting edge science. But I knew that I didn't want to live with the pain of not sharing what I'd written. So I did publish it, and that moved me along. And now, was the emotional cleansing, I guess is the way I would say it, or the, the um, bringing of the unconscious into the conscious, all of that had happened in the 10 years between the two books? So you were doing the experimenting on yourself? Wait, wait, oh. wait. <laughs> I wouldn't say that there's an emotional cleansing that happened. First of all, if I'm going to be cleaned emotionally, I'm the only one that can do it. And I didn't know how then. Oh, okay. So I was beginning to understand uh, some of the dynamics that lie beneath physical reality. But I was hardly emotionally clean. I was still very angry, and I still had a lot of frightened parts of my personality. But now I had some tools that I could begin to work with them. And I did begin to work with him, and I'm still working with him. And I intend to continue working with him because I don't intend to waste one moment of this life that I can remember not to waste indulging in anger or criticism or judgment. And when it, I am doing it, and I find myself doing it, I stop and I feel what's happening inside of me. I feel my emotions, and I decide what I'm going to do next. And you know what? I have abandoned all hope of ever removing the pain in me 
by changing someone else. And that has been the most refreshing thing that I can tell you. If there is such a thing as an emotional cleansing, that may be it. To really abandon all hope of ever removing the pain inside you by changing someone else. Creating authentic power is not an event. It is a process. And that process is your life. Not everyone uses their life to create authentic power. And as a result, when they come to the end of their life, they're not authentically powerful. It's as simple as that. And so another experience in the Earth School is created to heal the same things that you didn't heal this lifetime. You get another opportunity. You always get another opportunity. Well, Leanne, how did it feel for you having that intense hour and 20 minute conversation with Gary Zukoff? Oh, Jeff, actually, it's even longer than that. At some point, we can release some some shorts and <laughs> some clips. Uh, we talked for a good period of time, and it was uh, certainly heartful, soul-enriching, uh, wisdom-inducing. It was wonderful to be with him and, of course, his, his partner, who, who uh, has now passed on. But Linda Francis was in the home as well, and it was wonderful to be able to share the afternoon. I've known Gary, as I mentioned, for decades, and the one characteristic of of him is his intensity. He doesn't want to waste a minute. He's really determined that moment by moment by moment, he is going to be the best version of himself. That's right. He can be intense. I think he even says that in the interview. Um, he can, but there's so much wisdom that comes through. In, in uh, a short period of time, even though he's intense across the, the time span, uh, little snippets here and there, he just drops nuggets of gold. And one of my favorites is this idea that multisensory perception is coming to all, but authentic power is not. That we really have to do the inner work. And whenever you're triggered, that's the flag. That's the flag that something that is going on inside of you that needs to um, have some insight for you to turn inside. And why am I rageful? You know, what is promoting the jealousy or the fear and to have an understanding and an awareness? Uh, and that opens us up into um, much more interconnectedness from the heart center and being able to connect to each other in love. I thought his distinction between the, the way we think of power conventionally and authentic power is very important because many people seem to confuse external power for the real power of the soul. That's, that's right. I think that's one of his key messages, absolutely, is that uh, you, we want to merge the personality with the soul. That if we are, um, let, could we say, going along with convention and moving towards like a materialism or a power over instead of a power with, then uh, the ego is taking the reins too strongly that we must sit back and listen to the soul, uh, listen to the values, the integrity, the ethics of that still small voice within, if you will. And what we really want to do is merge the personality with the soul. And that will cultivate what he terms brilliantly, I think, authentic power. Well, Leanne, once again, thank you so much for sharing these older videos. I think they're classics. I expect that uh, people will be watching them long after you and I are both gone, <laughs> as well as the guests, be because they are touching on eternal truths. So it's uh, a heartfelt pleasure for me to be with you today and to share your work with our viewers. Wonderful, Jeff. And that heart connection goes both ways. It's so wonderful to be able to share this body of work uh, and to share it on your channel 
which is the leading edge of wisdom and knowledge and discovery, that cutting edge and humanity. Uh, if, if we listen and we understand the wisdom that's been coming through for ages, we have a good shot. We have a good shot. Thank you so much for being with me, Leanne. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.